Okay, so this is, this is regional scale risk assessment work, and this is what my PhD was on, and I've, I've had a wonderful opportunity to work with many students and, and specialists across the globe, um, and, and yeah, just to show you some of the data already today that we've been able to use to feed into some of these assessments. So I'm just going to give you some outcomes of a case study that we applied in Invoti, and again, just for, I'm, I'm just going to move through it quite quickly because um, you're, I'm sure you're tired of speaking to me already. We all know the problems and we know what's wrong. So what is ecological risk? It's assigning magnitudes and probabilities to adverse effects that we term hazards. Only when you have a hazard and understanding the hazard and its related uncertainty of effects is, is what we refer to as risk. So that's why, that's why we use the term risk because there's always going to be uncertainty associated with it. If you had no uncertainty, you wouldn't have to call it risk. You would say this is going to do that and there's the information. But as soon as you bring in the concept of risk, then there's an uncertainty. You're not sure if it's going to happen. There's a risk. There's a likelihood or not. Um, what's very important in terms of that in, in risk is that there has to be, you have to evaluate the exposure component and the effects component. Not only do things come into the environment and change it, but once they're in the environment, those things in the environment respond to it. So the way that one river like the Mgeni responds to a type of stressor compared to the Tugela is going to be very different. If I had one bucket of cyanide and I threw it in the Mgeni, the response would be much greater than I took that same bucket and threw it into the together because of the dilution factor, for example. So that's really the, the, the two aspects of risk that you need to consider, exposure and ecological effect. And because of that, it makes it applicable into environment where there's going to be a response to the environment, and that is what is ecological risk assessment. So there's a whole lot of, there are a whole lot of types of risk assessments, but that's really what defines ecological risk assessment. Now, there's a traditional risk assessment approach which considers a type of stressor, its receptors, and then the response. It's usually out of context of the environment, but we have the problem where we have these multiple sources, historical events, dynamic ecosystems, you know, unique and, and, and variable um, environmental conditions within the system itself, and multiple endpoints. We're not only worried about the fish, we're worried about the frogs, we're worried about the birds, we're worried about the people, the fishermen, we're worried about ecosystem services and ecological infrastructure. Okay, so there's all these things that we need to consider, and that's really what brought about regional scale risk assessment approach, which Wayne Land has developed. Um, and it considers the location of multiple sources, m multiple stresses, and how they impact on multiple receptors. And we refer to that as the habitat, the place where those receptors respond. And what is that going to affect? It's going to cause an impact. So those res receptors are going to change, and you're going to have loss of biodiversity. You're going to have um, loss of, of viable community states or population states, and you're going to have a... a, a, a a loss of the substance and fisheries, and that's what, that's what we call our endpoints. Um, so that's what we're working towards. Until two years ago, we were using this very complicated mathematical um, um, equation where you'd have to write it all up, and then you would often always get it wrong, and you'd have to go back and check the damn thing. And we've thrown that out the window, praise the Lord, and now we have Bayesian networks. So Bayesian network modeling has saved us time and money, and we are just just blown away at the capabilities and in fact we're doing some work locally and and from what I'm seeing overseas and hearing that we are writing case files and we are making it work for us in ecological terms and they're not yet so we've got a great opportunity and there's some really good stuff coming out of our local guys um, so watch this space Bayesian networks when you guys hear the term and you need to know how to use them come visit us we'll show you so this is what Wayne's done Wayne's worked all over the world he did a risk assessment of threats to the Amazon. He's just done a, some threat assessment of, 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 he's actually comes from a human tox background, so he did this, this sarin gas threat stuff. Anyway, Wayne's a big shot. That's why he gets the big bucks. And um, we're down here and we're just getting involved as well. We've got a really good collaboration going between Wayne and Victor Weppiner, who's at Northwest University, and ourselves here. Um, so we hope to continue and growing. And there's a lot of new guys coming in, so there's growth. It's a 10 step process and um, Quite simple. I'm not going to go into too much detail. And really what the greatest difference was in terms of the different steps, where you get to these steps eight and nine, where you have to start looking at, at the, the, the uncertainty, the amount of uncertainty you have because you've actually got no data. You actually know nothing about the problem. That's where South Africa and Southern African risk assessments fall short. And we had a major problem where we had to actually go back and say, you know, we cannot do it the way you're doing it in the, in the industrialized world where you can just use the data and say, okay, uncertainty is acceptable. Whenever we try that, it's always unacceptable because there's so much uncertainty. So we had to bring in a process of, of establishing hypotheses and testing the hypotheses and updating the risk assessment, and then the uncertainty would go down. And to do that, we published a paper last or a couple of years, years ago. OK, 
Okay, so that's the regional scale risk assessment method. Please read my paper. Okay. <laughs> this is the voting case study. Um, and by now, I hope you guys know where that is. Um, from Great Town right down to Stanger. Um, and then um, we've got a lot of information. We know a lot about what's going on already. Anthropogenic impacts, agriculture, forestry, industries, um, water stress, you know, the demand for water exceeds supply, um, all sorts of, of issues. And really the focus is on the lower part of the catchment. And you know what, I love it. Whenever people say, you know, whatever you do, if it doesn't get into the public domain or doesn't, it's not used, it just sits on a shelf, if you go write up a list of just recommendations that those people made to manage the Mvoti River, there are pages and pages and pages of recommendations and very, very, very few of them have ever been addressed. Okay, so that's maybe a little something that we should consider. Okay, um, again, I showed this earlier. If people haven't seen it, that this catchment is extremely highly stressed. Water quality problems, abstraction, habitat modification, kind of do what you want to do. So what we did is we went and, and, and consulted with stakeholders and came up with these socio-ecological endpoints. These are the things we're interested in. We want to maintain the biotic diversity. Not 100% maintain an acceptable level of biodiversity. And we actually picked that on current conditions. We agreed that now we would stop and we would work towards improvement. But we couldn't have it out of context and go back to, to um, pre, pre mandates. Okay, so that's, uh, that's something that we considered. And by the way, the risk approach is not dependent on benchmarks or reference conditions, which is really useful for us. Um, we should not result in pollution. So the Water Act must apply, meet water, water license stipulations, ecological flows, use ensure that use is sustainable, and most importantly, that the ecosystem must be safe and clean for local users. Okay, this is a conceptual model. Can you understand it? <laughs> Still don't. Don't worry, if, you, if I can't. But anyway, what it is, is it's relating. Um, I've already given you some idea of sources, those activities that cause the problem, the stresses, the water quality, the flow, the things that they result in, the receptors, the things that are going to respond to that, and here we selected uh, estuary, freshwater, riparian and wetlands as those receptors and as components within them, water and sediment quality, habitat alterations, flow alterations, disturbance to wildlife, erosion or siltation, for example, and then how that influences our, our endpoints. And this is really the, the conceptual model that guides all those little links in the old program. So we workshopped this for days and days and days and came up with this model to give us an idea of how those things are, are interacting. Then we go back and we collect all the data. And there's a lot of data available, a lot of data on flows, land use, uh, water license data, there's a lot of data available. And then we go and we, we form this ranking system. Now we had a question earlier about ABCDs and is, is D sustainable? In this case, what we do, we do something similar where we establish these ranks. And we've got usually zero, low, medium and high, where zero represents no threat, no risk, no problem. It's natural. High is totally unacceptable, unsustainable. So those two are easy to define. Okay, because we've got a lot of evidence to, to establish that. Then we've got low and moderate. Moderate is something where it is, it is acceptable, but, but it's kind of like a TPC concept, that you, you, you must manage this because it's approaching unsustainability. And then the low is what we would consider to be, there is some impact, but it's, it's sustainable and it's acceptable and we're happy. So we're managing usually towards low risk, not zero risk. Okay, and we define that and we reference it and we provide all the references for each one of those endpoints for barriers, for example. These are the different, that's what we know about the barriers, and these are the references. So all that data goes in to try and, des to try and describe what you know about the system and those variables that you're trying to relate. This is the outcome. Nice and clean and safe and healthy, or very low risk all the way down, considering that there's some, sh the sugar cane really starts down here. But you went from, from quite low into extremely high risk in the lower reaches. And then what we did is we found out that that resolution wasn't good enough, so we had to really go down into the river and its associated riparian ecosystems and look at some of those um, industries and or different types of sources and their stresses and try and evaluate that in a risk assessment. So we carried, so it was a two-tier risk assessment. First of all, a lot of uncertainty, it's pointing the finger down there, okay? And then we went in there and we carried out some hypotheses. So we looked at the communities, we looked at the fish, we looked at the, and that's really the, the example I gave of the fish, this is what the data went into. And this gives you a relative rank. So this is a risk score just to give an idea of comparing them with each other, which of the endpoints are the greatest risk. And you can see that they're all quite high, but safety and environment was, was, was actually not a problem. So, 
So that just gives you an idea of, of, of where you should be directing your, your energies towards which endpoints. And which of the ecosystems are threatened. Now this is for the whole catchment. The in-stream freshwater uh, portion of the catchment is at the greatest risk. Estuaries came out as very low, but the problem was that at this stage it was relative within the whole catchment, and that's because estuaries was in the, in the lowest risk region alone. Um, and I'm going to show you another slide on that in a moment, so just keep that in mind. And this is really the kicker. So now, this is the, 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 the risk of these sources to the endpoints. So if you wanted to try and go back and try and allocate the net contribution of a particular user to the integrated risk to each state, then this is how you do it. And this just shows you, in, in, in terms of what's driving the risk, it's not those industries that come up as the most, the most important. They can see the smoke and that's what comes out, but that's not what was the most causing the most impact. It was the plantations and the sugarcane. And we found out that all those ecological processes were responding to the changes in the, um, the, the habitat templates primarily. Okay, and that was a major discovery to show that the, this is the relative contribution of the different users to risk. Barriers, road, so it gives you an idea of what you should be going towards, what you should be looking at. And we actually can use this information if we unpack it and go back, especially with the new Bayesian modeling approach, to go and say, I can actually assign your prob I can actually evaluate and give you and justify your probable contribution to this problem and base your license on it. Okay, that's the, that's, the, that's the bigger picture. And that's why SAPI actually commissioned us to do this, because they needed to say, we've got one license that's a copy-paste and then vote in it together, and we need to know what's different about the two ecosystems and what's different about our use and different about the, ecos the responses to our impact in the ecosystems so that we can be managed effectively. Okay. Um, and then we go through a validation um, component. Now, this is, th this is just to show you how we, how, we, how we address the uncertainty. We generate hypotheses. And this is one of the greatest components of risk assessment. Jackie King, um, a, a, a well esteemed scientist, came to us one day and said she doesn't understand risk concept. And I love the example because she says, um, Tony Blair destroyed the whole national herd in, in England based on risk. And the uncertainty was great. But the... the, the the, the, the likelihood that it was going to have a huge impact on the people of Britain was so great that he acted upon that risk outcome. So I understand that. So sometimes we need information. And because we need information straight away, we need to carry out these type of assessments and, and document the uncertainty. And then the user or the regulator has to decide whether or not to, make it to, to act upon that information. And that's really what this does. Um, what I'd just like to show you quickly, I've already shown you the, 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 together, the together one, but this is what we've just finished. We've just looked at the Pongolo, and this is just to show you some r cute little relationships. So this is hot off the press, but I just wanted to show you. Um, and what we did is we looked at fish, birds, amphibians, and subsistence fisheries. And this was using that eco-classification scale again, current state. Now this is the value of our approach, is that all the information's in, and we can, we can establish the current risk. Now, as you can see, please don't let these colors conf confuse you because D is dark green, eh? So that's already barely sustainable. You know, water affairs, that used to be yellow, but they don't, yellow caused people to react badly. So now it's dark green. But anyway, don't be fooled, please. Dark green is, is barely susceptible, so or su is sustainable. So we found out that the frogs don't really care. The people aren't really having a problem. Uh, the birds are pretty good. The fish aren't too bad. But overall, it's not going very well, and Aduma is doing a wonderful job. Aduma is acting as a very important refuge for a lot of these components. So what happens if we protect the boundary? If we actually close in Dumu, all of these go back to reaching our desired requirements. Um, the frogs go back to pristine conditions, but the subsistence fisheries get hammered because they're not allowed to go to the river. Okay? What if we reduce the flows by 50%? What's the impact of, of um, not achieving your, your EWR from Jazini? Well, the fish get hammered, the birds get hammered, the frogs start complaining, but the people are okay. Okay, this is the value. So it's alternative scenarios and trying to get an idea of the, of the implications of these information. And it's all based on, 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 on the data we have. And by the way, there's a lot of uncertainty associated, but the process allows you to address the uncertainty, adapt the model, and, and reduce that uncertainty through time, and monitoring, 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 monitoring. Okay, by the way, what happens if you increase DDT by 100%? So currently, there's a lot of DDT issues. It is having an impact on the birds and the amphibians, but it's not huge, but if you double the DDT loads, there's a lot of thresholds that we're approaching. And you can see that the people of all are the most at risk. Okay? And then the then the fish 
the frogs and the birds get hammered. It has something to do with the eggshells. Okay, and then we integrate it using, yeah, perfect, I'm actually almost there. We integrate the data, we've got really awesome new techniques. This is Monte Carlo or Latin Hypercube um, technique. Don't worry, all it is is it's saying, you can't, how can you add fish and birds and frogs, which are totally independent endpoints with independent drivers together? Well, we, we use a, a number of random iterations. And in this case, I used a thousand iterations and I add them up and then allows me to, on the scale, compare current scenario. By the way, the, the dark blocks are pre-1900, so that's how we calibrate the model and it's working. So current scenario, pre-1900s, desired scenario, yeah, so just those three. So that just gives you an idea of how we determine this. Okay, that's it, I promise. <laughs>